Hey everyone, welcome to week three of Crash Course Old Testament. Uh, glad you could join us tonight. Hope this finds you well um, in the midst of all the COVID-19 stuff. Um, we thank you for uh, just taking this time to spend with us, dive into God's Word. Uh, we hope it's going to be a good night. Tonight we are going to shift gears. We're going on to a new topic, uh, a new area of study in the Old Testament. Uh, and we are going to begin a discussion, hopefully get all the way through, a discussion about authorship. Uh, so specifically some assumptions about that people commonly have about who wrote the books of the Old Testament, um, some theories that come up as to explain uh, who wrote the Old Testament, uh, and also some criticisms. Uh, so we're going to... Uh, Please don't be scared by the big words that I just threw out and that are, and that are showing up on this slide. Uh, we're going to break this down and make it super simple. This, is, this can be an area of study that gets bogged down in a lot of details, um, and we want to make that understandable. Um, so we're going to dive into it. It may sound like it's getting a little complicated, but I promise you it really isn't. Uh, and we're going to come back to some very basic, uh, simple takeaways to help us understand the Old Testament better tonight. So, uh, if you're new to this, uh, if you haven't been with us yet before, two things I recommend that you grab is your own copy of God's Word. Uh, as we're going through this tonight, feel free to flip around um, within it, kind of follow along and see the different books that we're talking about. Maybe uh, put a little marker on them so you know to come back later and look at something that we've talked about tonight. Um, and I also encourage you to grab a notebook. Uh, we're going to try to spend some time answering questions if anybody has questions at the end of this time. So if you do have any questions, make sure to throw those in the comments uh, and we'll be sure to answer those at the end of our time together tonight. Uh, and I recommend just writing those down uh, on a notebook if, you do, if you're following along or you can just throw them straight into the comments. Either one works. Okay. Um, I should also, before we, dump, before we dive in, I need to specifically address something that we're not going to talk about tonight um, that we're going to save for when we talk uh, when we're going to start hopefully going through the New Testament uh, something that we're going to save for when we talk about New Testament uh, authorship uh, and that is this thing called inspiration the inspiration of scripture and the fact that it is divinely inspired so what exactly does that mean what does it mean that God inspired scripture but humans wrote it that's a really big broad question so we're going to intentionally uh, save that for when we go through the new testament because frankly new testament authorship is much easier the actual authors the actual human authors of each book that's easier to explain than for the old testament the new testament is a bunch is the gospels we know exactly who wrote each one of those um, and a lot of letters, a lot of the epistles, um, and we know who wrote the vast majority of those. Hebrews is really the only wild card book. We don't know exactly who wrote it. So, suffice it to say, we're saving discussion of inspiration for New Testament. All right, without further ado, let's dive in to what we have tonight. All right, so what are some assumptions that people commonly have about authors of the Old Testament books. Okay, so what are some common assumptions that people have going into this topic? Okay, one common assumption, um, or you could just say this is a common belief that people may not put a lot of thought into, uh, is that Moses wrote all five books of the Pentateuch, all five books of the Torah. Uh, and the English um, breakdown, the English organization of the Bible, we call this the law. Okay, so it's the first, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Common idea is that, well, Moses wrote all five of those, and uh, a lot of times this is something that's not even really questioned. Um, sometimes people don't really think harder about it. Okay. Um, another common assumption is that books that share a name with a prominent character were written by that person. Okay, so an example of this would be First and Second Samuel. Okay, well, Samuel is a character; he's a pretty prominent character in. Uh, first Samuel. Okay, so the assumption may be for some people that, oh, Samuel wrote those books, or that the prophet Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah, or that the prophet Jonah, wow, he's a really prominent character in his own book, or in the book that he is, uh, that his story is featured in. So, 
I mean, it might make sense that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. Okay. Um, another assumption is that books were written by only one author. There was only one author that God divinely inspired. Again, we're going to save that term to discuss later, but one author that God divinely inspired, and that author wrote it, he finished it, and that was it. And it was never touched again. Okay, that's, this is something that people commonly assume. Uh, also, that the dates of authorship are determined and agreed upon, so we know when books were written, uh, and we scholars, Christians in general, agree, okay, this book was definitely written at this time. Okay, but not so fast. There, there, there's, there's more to the story than this. Okay, uh, the answer to this question, who wrote the books of the Old Testament? This is the question, this is the overarching question that we're going to try to answer tonight. Who wrote the books of the Old Testament? Uh, it's more complicated than that. Okay, authorship, uh, so the actual authors, the actual human authors who wrote the manuscripts, uh, dating, so the time at which it was written, uh, and document history, which is how each document uh, was copied, how it was maintained, um, and how the and how uh, the actual document itself, so how the Book of Joshua made it through the ages, so the history of the document. Uh, these things aren't always known for certain. We don't always know for sure. Like, okay, how did our actual manuscript of Proverbs get here? Okay, we may not know the answer to all of those questions exactly. Okay, scholars often disagree. People who are way smarter than you or me or anyone else, uh, or anyone else that we, that we might know of in our own local church settings, okay, these guys who study scripture for a living, okay, they often disagree about theories, about ideas of who wrote which book, all right? Um, there are many ideas about who wrote what and when and where they wrote it or why they wrote it. Um, and these theories are often kind of complicated, and the best part is that these theories are changing. As new evidence becomes available, um, so when we find new manuscripts or we figure out different ways to interpret the language better, uh, then things might change. Our ideas might change about, okay, this may not actually be written at this time, or it may not actually be written by this person, or maybe this is a better way to explain it. These things are changeable. Um, so today we're going to cover a couple of these theories of authorship, and we're going to try to hit every book in the Old Testament and explain its authorship, or at least uh, give an idea of, okay, this is who we think wrote it, this is our best uh, idea of who wrote it, and, and so forth, okay? So we'll start, with the, we'll start at the beginning, we'll start with the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the Law. Take whichever name you prefer. Okay, so who is the dominant character of the Pentateuch? Well, most people would say that it is Moses. All right, so Moses is a character who, uh, throughout the Bible, or through these first five books of the Bible, he's prominent in the story uh, of leading God's people out of Egypt. Um, he's the one who actually delivers the law um, that God speaks to Moses, God gives him the law, and then Moses actually delivers it to Israel, delivers it to the people, all right? And the law was three, or you would argue like three and a half, counting a good portion of Exodus. Uh, the law is three and a half of these books. So that's Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are law, uh, and roughly half of Exodus, well, j just to give a good estimate number. That's not, it's not exactly half, all right? So Moses is prominent. His work is prominent. His delivery of the law is prominent throughout these first five books, all right? So uh, this section of books, these five books are often attributed, which means uh, they're just connected to Moses. They're often credited as Moses's written works, all right? So in fact, uh, Jesus, later uh, in the New Testament, would actually refer to uh, the Pentateuch as uh, the Book of Moses, or common other terms would just be the Law of Moses, or when you may read in the Bible that someone uh, is reading from Moses. All right, it's not to say that like, there's a Book of Moses, 
lying around somewhere that we haven't found yet. Okay, There is no book of Moses exactly that name in the Bible. So when you hear somebody say this, what they mean is they're reading from the Pentateuch. They're reading from the first five books of the Bible, which are commonly attributed to Moses. All right. Uh, church tradition also holds that Moses was uh, the author of Genesis Deuteronomy. So throughout the ages, throughout the history of the church, people have generally agreed, okay, Moses, probably the author of the first five books. All right. Um, nowhere, here's the interesting thing, nowhere does the Pentateuch actually say Moses wrote this. Okay. That does not occur anywhere uh, in scripture or anywhere in these first five books. Okay. Um, in other books of the Bible, we actually do find places where the author says, hey, I'm the author, I wrote this. Okay. So we think of the beginning of the book of Acts. All right. uh, Luke identifies himself as the author, and in fact, he also identifies the person that he's writing to. Uh, it's a guy named Theophilus. I believe that's his name. If I'm not pronouncing it correctly, please leave it in the comments. I like to know when I'm saying things wrong. Um, so Luke identifies himself as the author directly in the book of Acts. Moses doesn't do that here. Um, so he, this isn't uh, an autographed work. Okay, it's not like it's not like where you see paintings done by like Van Gogh or Degas or whoever famous painter. And what do they often? What do they always do? They always sign it like somewhere down in the bottom corner or something. All right, uh, there's no that doesn't happen here. So if this was written by Moses. He didn't sign it as his own work, uh, basically. All right, so what's a theory that can explain maybe how it was written if it wasn't written by Moses? Okay, let's talk about the documentary hypothesis. Okay, so the documentary hypothesis, I'm going to abbreviate it as DH from now on in these notes. Uh, it was championed by a German scholar named Julius Wilhausen. Uh, again, if I'm not pronouncing that right, please tell me. Uh, then again, my German is not fantastic, meaning it's non-existent. Uh, so Wellhausen rejected Mosaic authorship. He said, nope, Moses definitely didn't write the first five books of the Bible. Well, if you say that Moses didn't write it, you got to explain it a different way. And he did, or he tried to. So he pointed to four different literary styles in the Pentateuch. So literary style, um, basically you can understand it as like three different ways of writing, three different patterns of writing. So not to say that he was writing in three different languages or four different languages. It wasn't like he was writing in Mandarin for one section and then it's Italian and then it's Russian and then it's you know, Swahili or something like that. Okay, it's not four, four different languages, but it's four different styles of writing. All right, and we can see different styles of writing. Like, um, if you've ever played uh, the game Telephone, where you've got people lined up next to each other and you start off with a message at one end, okay, uh, and you're passing the message along. Okay, one person hears it, then they turn around and say it back to the next person. All right. Uh, a similar thing can happen when you're writing, perhaps. This is the idea behind this, is that you tell people, uh, is that you have different people writing the same thing, and different styles can emerge. You, people don't write the same thing the exact same way. If you have four different reporters um, who are covering a news story, and they're writing for four different newspapers... Well, they're, all, they're not all going to write it in the exact same way. The, par the paragraphs might be different lengths. Um, they may use certain describing words that are different from each other. They more, may use more commas in their sentences. They may use more semicolons. Uh, there are a million different ways to write the same thing, and, and, it, and it has a different style. So what Wellhausen is pointing to is that he thinks that there are four different literary styles Identif that you can see, that you can identify in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, in the law. All right? And he said, okay, each one of these different styles came from a different author. All right? So he suggested uh, authors uh, for kind of the four different ones, and he named them the Yahwist, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, and the Priestly Writer. And we're not going to get into the details of, like, which... Um, uh, person uh, has which which section of the text, like what what passages did the Yahwist uh, 
uh, right or, or such. Those, those things can be found. If you're curious about what exactly those are, I can link you to an article. Um, so again, wow, this is a weird way of making those pop up. My mistake. Uh, so continuing the documentary hypothesis, uh, what makes or what indicates different authors? We just discussed this. What makes your writing different from another's? Okay, so it can be things like word selection, sentence structure, thematic tendencies, uh, literary devices. So if you use things like metaphor, hyperbole, uh, analogies, that kind of stuff. All right. Um, yeah, so some interesting facts about two of the authors that Wellhausen points to. Uh, they derive, he derived the names from two of the uh, Hebrew names for God. Um, and then so uh, just as a quick way to identify uh, the different authors, instead of saying like Yahweh, Elohim, Priestly Rider, all that each time, he gave each one uh, a one-letter abbreviation. So the Yahwist is J, the Elohist is E, so on, and then... He gave the supposed, supposed, supposed uh, dates of composition, which means the date, the the approximate year that the, that that section was written. Okay, and he said this year, eight eight forty BC, was the approximate date that he gave to when the Yahwist wrote his section of the Pentateuch. Okay, and then the Elohist came about one hundred and fifty years later. Uh, the Deuteronomist came about 160, 170 years after that. All right, so four different authors, four different time periods, all contributing to the same kind, to the same uh, literary block, the same five books, the Pentateuch. Okay. So, what are some flaws in this theory? All right, let's put it on our thinking caps for a second. What what can you see that doesn't necessarily work with the documentary hypothesis. Okay, what does it overlook or dismiss? Look at that uh, particular. Okay, the documentary hypothesis overlooks the long-held traditional views of authorship. It rejects the idea, completely out of hand, that Moses wrote any portion of the Pentateuch. Okay, so it argues from the get-go. Moses didn't have any part of it. it they didn't. They, he, the, Wellhausen, doesn't even argue that. Uh, Moses may have even been one of the four authors. Uh, he rejects it outright. Okay, uh, which he, he has to because if you go back to the dates of composition that he suggests, uh, 840 BC is well after Moses's death, right? Way after Moses's death. Uh, so it's impossible that this that Moses could have been a contributing author to the Pentateuch because, well, he was dead. Okay, so uh, these are some of the things that it overlooks. Um, also, this is just a good idea to keep in mind for biblical interpretation and just ideas about dealing with scripture um, at this point. Uh, if you have an, a completely original idea about scripture, about, oh, this must this passage must mean this, or maybe this book was written by this guy. Uh, if you can't find anyone else over two, we have almost over 2,000 years of Christian history. If you can't find anyone else that agrees with you or has thought this thing up before you, you're probably wrong. Okay, uh, there are not very many original ideas left that are correct when it comes to biblical interpretation. Um, there, there, as Christians, we should, uh, before we think too highly of ourselves and what we think is the right idea, um, we should have a strong, a strong uh, respect for the traditional interpretation, uh, strong respect for the people who have gone before us, the scholars, the pastors, the Christian uh, thinkers and philosophers of the ages. Um, who have thought very long, very carefully about these things, who have studied these things well, okay, and come to solid conclusions, all right? The documentary hypothesis overlooks this, tra this tradition of the traditionally held view of Moses' authorship, uh, and I think it does that to uh, its own detriment. I think that's a weak point uh, in this theory, okay? Another problem is that it promotes human reason over 
uh, divine revelation. Okay, so specifically, remember a second ago uh, when we were talking about uh, different names for the Pentateuch? Sometimes it's referred to as uh, the Book of Moses or uh, just referred to as just Moses. You say, oh, I've been reading Moses. That means I've been reading the Torah. Okay, Jesus himself referred to the first five books of the Bible as the Book of Moses. Okay, in other words, in an in indirect way perhaps, Jesus affirmed that the first five books of the Bible are indeed written by Moses. Okay, so what the documentary hypothesis does is it overthrows that, it overthrows the fact that Mosaic authorship, while it's not, doesn't appear actually in the Torah, it appears later in Scripture, it's still throwing out the fact that it appears in Scripture. Uh, and that's dangerous, and it's and it's coming, and it's coming up with this different idea that sounds reasonable, like it's it may be a good argument, but it's completely made up by human beings. Okay, it's this guy's way of reasoning around, trying to explain by himself, uh, in, in a way that has that it has to reject another part of scripture in order to make it work, um, and that's. That's not a good way to operate uh, dealing with scripture. Okay, uh, so what is another idea? This comes from uh, a pastor named Desmond Alexander. Okay, so the variety of literary types found within the Pentateuch argues against a single author being responsible for everything. So in other words, it's not likely that one single author was responsible for everything that's in the Pentateuch. These different literary genres, these different literary types indicate probably that there are different authors to some extent. Okay. Rather, continuing his quote, the evidence points to one or more editors taking existing materials and skillfully shaping them together according to an overall plan. Okay. So this word editors is important here. Uh, the idea that the material was already there, it already existed, it was already part of Jewish culture, we had the first five books of the Bible, they just needed to be put together in a skillful way. Okay. Now, this is not an argument against Mosaic authorship. Okay, Moses still could have written these books, absolutely, but they could have still become disconnected uh, and, and and jumbled and uh, and just not uh, good word would be coherent. They they didn't all fit together well. Okay, so an editor could come to, could pull these things together and pull them into actual books that we can use, that we can understand, that have a flowing story that makes sense, that pulls everything that Moses wrote, or perhaps one or two authors, other authors wrote, pulls it together and makes it uh, understandable. Okay? Now, this is also a good place to note that God can inspire more than one author per book. Okay? If I believe that Moses did actually write the first five books of the Bible. Okay, but I also believe that God could have inspired these editors okay, to be equally correct, to be equally perfect with the handling of his word and form it into the way that we have it now. Okay, So when you see that uh, this idea that there might be editors, that doesn't mean that humans have ruined it. Please don't hear that at all. Um, scripture affirms, and we have every reason to believe, that God has preserved his word in a completely truthful and reliable way throughout history. Okay, full stop. No, nothing else uh, added to it. No imperfections, no changes, nothing. The Bible we have today, I believe, and Christians throughout history have firmly believed, the Bible we have is the word of God as he intended us to have it. Okay? And there may be variances with translations and uh, individual words and, and what have you, but the Bible we have, it is reliable and it is God's word. And we may, again, depending on what translation you like, you may be able to understand it better, you know, translating the Greek and Hebrew in slightly different ways. But that's okay. At the end of the day, it's still the same book.
All right? Okay, where are we on time? All right, we've got about 10 minutes to cover the other books, which are easier and faster to cover. So let's get through it. Okay, so who wrote the historical books? Joshua, Judges, Ruth, or the records of the kingdoms of Israel. So this would be the books of First uh, and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. All right. Some people assume, again based on the titles, that Joshua was written by Joshua. First and Second Samuel written by Samuel. By the way, big problem with just Samuel is, well, he dies in First Samuel, and you can't write about yourself. Or can't continue writing a story if you're dead. So, yeah, Samuel didn't write First and Second Samuel. Okay, again, authorship a bit more complicated. So let's get into something called the Deuteronomistic history. I didn't come up with this title. I'm sorry if you're trying to write that down in your notes or something. Uh, what is it? Okay, so it's a theory about the authorship of the Book of Deuteronomy, which is where it gets its name, obviously through 2 Kings. So trying to explain the history of Israel from point A, Deuteronomy, to point B, 2 Kings. Basically from uh, return of, from Egypt, so, so going into the promised land, beginning of the story, to exile in uh, Babylon, end of the story, 2 Kings. Okay? Uh, Martin Noth, that is the guy who promoted this idea, the beliefs Simply stated, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, all of these books were assembled, they were put together, Avengers Assemble, yep, yeah, never mind, uh, during the Babylonian exile. So the point of putting these books together to have a, is to have a history of Israel to preserve Israeli identity and explain the exile. So we have this whole story of the kingdoms explaining, okay, this is where we messed up. This is what we did wrong to break God's covenant. Okay, This is the story of how we broke God's covenant and why we are currently in exile as part of our punishment for breaking the covenant. We've talked about covenants already. Okay, So stories had different sources. In other words, they came from different people, different authors, different um, styles. Uh, but they were linked by a common theology. They still had the same uh, story altogether, the same basic idea. Okay, Deuteronomy served as the theological and historical introduction, which is where we get the title of the theory. Okay, so closer inspection. This is where this theory begins to not really work. Okay, so the idea is... Uh, that all these books were put together again during the exile. They were put together at a later time all at once. Here's the problem. The books of, the Deuteronom of Deuteronomy through 2 Kings are very different, especially in tone. All right? so, and this is how we know, for a really good idea at least, uh, one of the uh, affirming factors that the Bible did have different human authors is the fact that the books sound different. So take Joshua as a different, as a very unique tone. It's very positive, very progressive. Um, Joshua is leading the people. They're full of hope. They're going into the promised land. Finally, after 40 years, uh, land flowing with milk and honey. They're going to uh, cross the Jordan. They're going to uh, take Jericho. They're going to conquer the rest of the land. Tear down the idols uh, and and make a place for God's people. Oh, and everybody else gets their, all the tribes of Israel, all 12 tribes, they each get their own plot of land to live at, and everybody's super happy, and it's great. Joshua is a, very, is a pretty upbeat, uh, positive book in tone, all right? Judges, not so much. Negative, cyclical. Um, this, this cycle of uh, God's people uh, disobey, and he raises up a judge, and they lead, uh, and he leads them to uh, put away their idols to come back to worship of him, and then after a time, Israel falls away, and God raises up another judge, and he tells them to throw away the idols, and he leads them back to right worship of him, and it happens over and over and over again, and it's kind of and it's depressing. Um, Israel is not learning their lesson; they're not following God well, and they're constantly being oppressed by people like the Midianites and the Philistines, um, and we see this over and over again. Uh, Samuel and Kings, also very different, very unique in their own ways. Okay, so what does this suggest? 
Well, basically, it suggests that the stories have different origins. Each different style, Joshua, Samuel, Kings, the different styles that they have indicate that they were written at different times by different people. Okay? Not all pulled together, not all written at once and put together at one time during the exile. Okay? Um... There's also the fact that many of the stories in these books feature eyewitness accounts, and you can't have eyewitness-type accounts of something that happened several hundred years beforehand. So if you're in the Babylonian exile, you will not... There's no first-hand witnesses of the crossing of the Jordan or the taking of Jericho. Those people are long since dead, all right? So being able to have uh, eyewitness-type accounts of those events... Uh, for writing the book means that you have to have that book written when those witnesses are still alive, all right? Which means it had to be before the Babylonian exile, okay? Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, so the exilic assembly, again, doesn't work. Um, and it's not the only good explanation of the common story that builds throughout um, the history of Israel. Okay, poetic books. We're running short on time, uh, but poetic books are, are, are going to be relatively simple to cover. All right, um, actually based on time, we're actually going to save... We're going to come back next week to cover prophets. Um, and that is when we will also get into uh, canonization. So uh, we're gonna we'll finish doing poetic books real quick, and then we'll get into uh, we'll save prophets for next week because we're short on time. All right. So the book of Job. Uh, this book is notoriously difficult to date. Scholars don't really agree on when it was written. Um, also, like the Pentateuch, it doesn't specify who wrote it. Uh, and unlike the Pentateuch, it has no indication of when exactly it was written. Most people believe, and I subscribe to this as well, uh, that the story of Job is actually at the time of the patriarchs. Okay, so the four patriarchs of uh, Israel are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joshua. All right. So, in other words, Job does not actually happen around the time of King David and Solomon. Uh, despite the fact that Job is situated around Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes and all that. Okay, Job doesn't actually, in the, in the flow of Scripture, in the timeline of Scripture, Job doesn't actually fit there. It fits somewhere between Genesis and Exodus. All right? So, story is said during the time of the patriarchs. Some people argue uh, that Job may have been the very first book of the Old Testament to be written. All right? Uh, bottom line for this, because we don't know exactly who wrote it, uh, Job's text is very unique. It's very distinct from the rest of the Old Testament, uh, which means it's, it's very unlikely that there were multiple authors all contributing to the writing of this book. This is called composite authorship. Okay, So we don't know who wrote Job. Well, we know that it was probably just one author. Uh, that's, a, that's our best guess. And regardless of who exactly wrote it or when exactly it was written, that doesn't have very much effect on how we interpret it and how we can use the story of Job and how it applies to our lives uh, and gives us a better understanding of God and um, ourselves and how we relate to God. Okay? Poetic books. Psalms. Oh, uh, quick aside, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. If you're referring to a psalm, a single chapter from the book of Psalms, it is called a psalm. It is not called Psalms number whatever. So if you say, uh, turn to Psalms 23. No, no. It is either Psalm 23, singular, or it is the 23rd Psalm. The book of Psalms is a collection of individual psalms, which are referred to in the singular. Psalm. All right, I'm going to quit saying psalm now and move on. All right, authorship. Uh, it is much clearer among these texts, but basically because each time a psalm is written, we have this handy little line right, above the, right below the heading that says a psalm of David or a psalm of Asaph or a psalm of uh, 
whoever the author might be, uh, the, the, uh, the songwriter. Okay, so David wrote the lion's share of them. He wrote uh, 73 of the Psalms for sure. Uh, Solomon wrote Psalm 72. A guy named uh, Asaph, who was a temple musician during David's reign, he wrote Psalm 73. Moses wrote Psalm 90. Uh, and a couple of them, we don't know exactly who wrote them, uh, but they are attributed um, to uh, points in Old Testament history. All right, Proverbs associated with King Solomon. Uh, and this one, in my opinion, is pretty solid. There's not really much of a reason to disagree with um, Solomon writing most of this book, at least. Uh, it does mention a couple of outside parties, like King Hezekiah of Judah, um, which would seem to indicate that at least one or two of the Proverbs were written after Solomon, uh, but that doesn't change the lion's share of the book. Uh, it does have some strong similarities with other Near Eastern wisdom texts. So one common criticism of the book of Proverbs is that, oh, it sounds just like all these other Arab Proverbs. So whoever wrote the book of Proverbs was stealing from other people's work. Okay? Yes. Well, no, actually. That's not what was going on. Yes, it sounds similar, but that's because Proverbs was written in a time and place and region similar to all of those old Arab proverbs. So it would make sense that their wisdom literature actually sounds a lot like this wisdom literature. Okay, There, there would be common similarities with how uh, sentences are structured, um, uh, different uh, characters or ideas that would have just been common in the culture because there were cultural similarities. So that doesn't disprove that this was still a divine and unique uh, biblical text. Okay, uh, it may have also, or probably was, composed over a long time, like the Book of Psalms. Okay, Ecclesiastes traditionally credited to Solomon. Short run of it is that it's perhaps best to think of it as an anonymous book. Um, it, but, and some scholars suggest that this one was written much later in the Old Testament, so sometime around the late Proverbs, uh, maybe a little before Malachi. Okay, Song of Solomon. Here's the interesting one. Uh, again, authorship here doesn't really affect uh, our interpretation of the book. Um, traditionally, it's associated with Solomon. The text mentions Solomon. Uh, and there's not really much debate about whether he's a character that's in the account. Some people, though, will argue that Song of Solomon is composed of different authors, they're, they're, they're poems written by different people at different times, and that they are analogous, meaning that if this isn't actually an account of an actual story between two people. Um, there's two huge problems with this right off the bat. One, Song of Solomon has a narrative story that fits, okay? From point A to point B, the, at the beginning to end of the book, we have characters, uh, with a story, and the story flows, it makes sense from point A to point B, okay? That doesn't happen if you're writing with multiple authors over a significant period of time. Heck, it doesn't even work with three different movie directors who try to write a Star Wars trilogy. That was, an, that was abysmal, and it would have been much worse with the Bible, okay? So, it has narrative continuity, is what this is called. So, that would... It doesn't indicate that there are multiple authors. Also, the Book of Song of Solomon is definitely not analogous. No matter how many pastors want to say that it's not talking about uh, biblical sexuality in marriage the way God designed it and intended it, no matter what people want to say to argue against it, that's what it's talking about. And the language is very clear. Um, and no scholar worth their salt anymore is going to try to claim that. Song of Solomon is analogous. Okay, Lamentations. Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, Lamentations is still poetic. Last one. Uh, textually, this one is anon anonymous, but it is traditionally attributed to the prophet Jeremiah. There's not really much reason to dispute this. Jeremiah was at Jerusalem when it was destroyed. He had eyewitness testimony, and it makes sense that he was able uh, to write about it in uh, this same way. Okay.
Now we're up against the profits. We are out of time for tonight. We're right at 40 minutes. So if you have any questions, um, let me check comments real quick. Okay, I got nothing. So uh, if you have any questions about this material, please feel free to email me, text me, call me, whatever. I'll be happy to answer any questions you'll have. Uh, thank you for watching this video, either tuning in live or uh, watching it later. Uh, we hope you find it helpful, and we'll see you next week. See you all later. Hang on.